Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Small Biz Gone Viral, a show that humanizes the impacts COVID-19 is having on small businesses, and more importantly, the humans that run them. I'm your host, Grant LeBeau, and besides having a face for radio slash podcasts, I also own a small business that has been hit particularly hard these past six months. We're only just one of countless similar stories, but for whatever reason, the stress of it all really hit me hard this last week. So apologies in advance if this episode is slightly less hopeful than normal. Now, maybe because in the beginning we were told, quarantine for two weeks and it'll all be better. Or maybe because the notion of American exceptionalism had me thinking we could learn from China, Italy, and other countries hit hard early. But for whatever reason, I just thought we would be closer to solving this than we are. In fact, when I started this podcast, I thought it would be a 10 or 20 episode kind of thing. Sort of a spring hobby, not a proverbial 40 years wandering in the business desert. Instead, in spite of knowing it was coming, we as a country have done a historically bad job of navigating the pandemic. And as a result, small businesses like mine are essentially on life support, holding out hope for rapid deployment of a vaccine while grasping at government support, praying Congress passes that next round of PPP or EIDL or whatever acronym comes next. Remember that those grant and loan programs that I just mentioned, they were designed to help prop up small businesses through two months of a pandemic. And we're in month seven, and probably only halfway through it. A hodgepodge of state and local government mandated closures without a corresponding national policy combined with expired funding is problematic to say the least, and I'm predicting we're going to end up with a record-shattering number of small business closures before this is done. And on that downer, let's get to our fun fact. Yay! For the first time since this stat was recorded in 1900, the majority of U.S. young adults age 18 to 29 live with their parents. The previous high was 48% in 1940, following the Great Depression and coinciding with World War II. That number fell to 29% in 1960 and has been steadily rising, peaking previously at 44% in 2010, which of course was the first year of true recovery following the Great Recession. Only a few months into the pandemic, and that share has reached 52% as of July. It seems like that number can only get higher as more and more temporary layoffs turn permanent and uncertainty continues to grow. But on an up note, if you owned tons of Zoom, Shopify, or Apple stock before the pandemic, you might be able to afford to live on your own. And on that, let's get to our facts and figures. We do these facts and figures each week as contextual background for the interview. Each episode, we hit on COVID stats, unemployment figures from the past week, stock market indicators and indices, and maybe an economic story or two. If you'd like to hear more or less of something, email your ideas to smallbizgoneviral at gmail.com or send a message on Facebook or Insta or directly through our contact page at smallbizgoneviral.com. It's fall 2020, and it's more important than ever to be an active participant in shaping the world, even if that means just getting started by emailing a podcast host. Speaking, though, of being an active participant, please register to vote. Today we begin with COVID numbers from the week of September 18th. Worldwide total cases just surpassed 30 million, with 7.4 million of those currently active, and we are continuing to see more cases diagnosed each day than the day prior. As the world approaches 1 million COVID-related deaths worldwide, the U.S. hit a tragic benchmark of its own last week, surpassing 200,000 deaths. The number of daily new cases is continuing to hover right around 40,000, about where we were in mid-June. On to the stock market, the S&P is down 8% from its early September high, perhaps a bit of a course correction after stocks jumped up 60% from the initial COVID lows back in late March. New unemployment filings stayed steady at 860,000 last week, which somehow is now viewed as normal though that would have been absolutely record-shattering prior to the pandemic. The most important story, though, far and away, is the tragic and untimely passing of Supreme Court Justice and pop icon Ruth Bader Ginsburg. 
She was instrumental in carving out rights that may seem so ordinary now, but were only solidified because of her lifetime of work. RBG's efforts resulted in, among many, many other things, women being allowed to open a credit card in their own name, play a sport in school, lease or buy property in their own name, and even simply consent to medical treatment. She stood up for justice, she stood against bullies, and she stood with friends of equality. For these reasons, and so many more, Justice Ginsburg will truly be missed. My guest today is Andrea Seemayer, founder and CEO of Alin, maker of luxury basics better fit for individuals' body types. Alin is one of the first, if not the first fashion brand to offer a full line of clothing that includes length options. So instead of being limited to the usual small, medium, and large, all of their shirts, pants, dresses, etc., come standard with the additional length option of long, regular, and short. Andrea will share her journey taking a decade of industry experience and building a brand whose main source of advertising, marketing, and sales used to come from in-person events. And of course, what adjustments she is making to survive and thrive through COVID. Andrea, thanks so much for being here. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, coming all the way from the Ozarks. Yes, right now I am in the Ozarks. Um, A bit more famous than it was a few years ago now that there's a show. Yeah, thanks to Jason Bateman. So I want to get straight into it because I feel like you have kind of a, a unique perspective because of the way that your business was affected so much earlier than than most of my guests, I suppose, have been. So let's go ahead and start with just what is your personal background that got you into the world of fashion? I have been in the fashion industry for my entire career. So I started off as a creative designer and then kind of took a little bit of a turn to focus on technical design, which for anyone not in fashion, that does not have anything to do with building computers. (laughs) Um, it's more about building, I always say the blueprints of clothing. So I'm the person that takes that design from a piece of paper and makes it come to life and then also makes it fit the human. So, you know, we get in a sample, sometimes your first prototype from a factory, the sleeves might be backwards, you know, like some crazy things. Um, and so I have to turn that into a garment that you can actually wear and fit and it can fit anyone from a zero all the way up to a 30. And then, you know, really handling all the logistics in between. And I guess fashion was always a bit of a passion to me. Um, But I really, I went to college for it. And I decided to do that. I grew up as a dancer, like a competitive dancer through high school. And a lot of my friends went on to do it post high school and like didn't go to college. They went on to have careers in it. And I thought oh, well, that career will only last until you're like in your early 20s. And so I started designing my costumes. And that's kind of how I was like, okay, I'm not going to be a professional dancer, but I really do enjoy designing my costumes. And so like from high school, I was like learning how to sew and design things. And I was like, I think fashion design is the route I'm going to take. And that's how I decided. And then from, you know, like I didn't really pivot from college. Like some people go to college and do completely other things. Right. Like I knew that that's what I wanted to go to college for. That's what I wanted to study. And that's what I wanted to become. And it's really this, I've been on the same path ever since. Yeah. And then you had a relatively uh, successful career working for some of the the bigger brands, yeah. right? Yes, exactly. I, um, I started off with a private label or some people call it a white label. Um, and we did more large mass retailer brands like uh, Macy's or Kohl's and things of that nature. And, but I was doing, working on like 10 brands at once. And I knew that I didn't like that. I like really like to focus and hone in on a single brand and really like learn the brand, you know, design to my best ability and like dive in and become that customer. So after that, I was able to get out of the mass retailers and into more of the high end New York city designer brands. And I was with Alice and Olivia, then to Rebecca Taylor, and most recently before Aylin was Zach Posen. Gotcha. 
And so when you were doing the, the private labeling, just to be clear, that's like the way that Kirkland brand at Costco, you know, they, ha they have Kirkland brand uh, batteries. They're not, they don't actually own a, a battery factory. They're just getting, having Duracell print batteries. So it's the same way that, if, you know, Target, they're, they're not manufacturing their own t-shirts. They're outsourcing that to someone else and basically putting a Target label on it, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay, you're in the industry, you kind of go from... Uh, you get a, a range of experience and then eventually what led you to start Aylin? Because of my responsibilities in my career, being the person that makes it fit, being the person that is really making the garment come to life and then seeing all the different body types as I'm, I'm fitting the garment, you know, on a fit model that we use to make it fit. And then we just use the mathematical grid to get it to all those other sizes. But then also being in a place like Zach Posen or, you know, Alice and Olivia, these higher end brands, we're also doing personal fittings on people that can afford to come shop straight from the showroom or a gown we're putting on the red carpet and we have to make it fit to all these other individual bodies that aren't the standard size four. And I realized that there's a major pain point and fit limitation between width to length ratios. So just because you're an extra small doesn't mean that you're short. And what happens with our grading system is that there's only about a three inch difference from an extra small to an extra large in length. But I'm, I myself am five foot zero. So in a room full of women, I am definitely more than a three inch difference than anyone around me. And so just because, you know, and I'm a small, I'm not an extra small. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to get that short waisted measurement or pants that are short enough for me without, you know, either shopping kids clothes. I can literally shop Zara kids <laughs> or, you know, like going into a petite fitting garment where sometimes petite, they make the shoulders really narrow and they make things more narrow just to be shorter, but that's not always the case. There's also women that are an extra large and also short. So what I found is that I had the ability, I'm the person that makes the grade scale. Like I make that mathematical equation that we use to find all the different sizes. So I must know a way to offer a different type of sizing so that women can pick both their length and their width. And so I was like, well, I'm clearly meant to start a new company to make all of us that are outside the standard check boxes in the fashion industry feel happy and have a place to shop comfortably and confidently. So I started Aitlin. So born out of both professional and personal experience. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So heading into 2020, tell us a little bit about Aitlin in terms of what it was forecasting, its uh, staff size, et cetera kind of setting the table for moving into the mid-COVID segment, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, just a short bit for a background on Aylin. We launched the website live in 2000, the end of summer 2018. So it, it's relatively new there. Um, you know, we've been, we grew 50% year over year since we had started in revenue. And so... We also realized that we, we did a lot of pop-ups and in-person events to reach new audiences because I, I bootstrapped the company. I, you know, I built it myself on my own dime. And having a direct-to-consumer brand means that you have to house all your own inventory. And with my size system, it means I have a lot more sizes than most fashion brands, and I have a lot more inventory. So I spent all of my own funding um, on building the company and having inventory. So our, our marketing budget was very small from the start. Uh, so to get that growth, we were doing a lot of traveling to new cities and hosting pop-ups, doing a lot of in-person events and like drawing a crowd by physically going to them, like practically like campaigning, right? So right. like we're going to like, you know, it's easy to do in New York City, but we're going to LA. I come to St. Louis, my hometown. You know, we'd go to like Chicago or like different cities to introduce Aylin to people in person. Um, and so through that, we saw a lot of growth. We were able to, you know, gain customers. We're able to gain Instagram followers, e you know, get email addresses, whatever it is. Um, and so we had planned on doing a lot more of that in 2020. So we had grown 50% year over year, but this year with, you know, a bit more budget to do more in-person events, 
Right. We continue to grow by a, around 120% because we saw, we knew how much, you know, every event we make this much money and we can increase events by 50% this year. And then, then we have a small market, you know, now we have a little bit of a marketing budget from our sales that we can invest in right. social marketing. So we're like, okay, this is going to be a great year. Yeah. Oh, good times when, we, when, uh, when this was going to be a great year. Yeah. And that didn't seem like the craziest statement of all time. And I realized that I didn't really give you a, a time yet to tell us exactly why your company is so unique. You mentioned that the fashion industry tends to try to pigeonhole basically everyone into, or at least on the female side uh, mm -hmm. of fashion into kind of like a one size fits all, like small, medium, and large. Whereas yeah. on, on the guy's side, you know, we tend to have not in shirts as much, but with pants, it's like, well, you're, I'm, you're a 33, 30 and you're getting a height and a width. So yep. what makes a Lynn unique in the fashion and fashion world? Yeah. Um, so like we said, we have a new, what I, I call it sizeology. Um, and you know, we're sustainable. So that's great. So we're a sustainable fashion brand and we're focusing on a personalized fit for women of all shapes and sizes. And we do that by offering, like you mentioned with the men's pants, um, a width and a length right now we do all extra small through extra large and every size comes in short, regular and long. So we use 32 points on the body for our measuring system and all of those measure points change slightly for each size. So your waist position slightly raises and lowers from a short to a long, your leg length, your arm length, your the position of your neckline. So if it's a V-neck, it'll be a little bit higher for the short, a little bit longer for the long. All of those things slightly change. It's not just the hem of your dress or pants. Um, and like, as you mentioned, like men, even for like suiting, a uh, button down is a, a neck width and an arm length, a blazer is a chest right. width and arm length, you know, and your all of your pants are waist in in seam. And for women, we only have a one number system. So that's really what I'm trying to change. We do have a two number system for denim only. And the reason for that is because denim was built for men. And I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah. So yeah, Levi's, it took Levi's 60 years from the first pair of men's jeans to the first pair of women's jeans. And now, of course, their highest grossing sales are through the women's division. Um, right. Of, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why, uh, that's why we have the two number system there is because it was built for men. Um, same. There's lots of differences. Uh, like a men's pair of pants, ours, ours at first, the opposite. Like we use our left hand to is it up? You guys use your right. And that yeah. is because back in the day, women had someone to get them ready. So it was the, they're made for, you know, their hand, you know, the handmade was. Right. And so assuming everyone is right handed, mm -hmm. you would have, you, it would be invert, the direction would be inverted. So yeah. your, your right handed assistant could help you. That yeah. is so funny. Mm -hmm. oh, I love fun facts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and is there much competition or any competition? in the yeah, no. of a two number system for for women um currently not really i mean there's a lot of custom made things but we're not custom made we you know we make all the inventory and it's ready to where you can order it it's sitting in the warehouse ready to for you to wear it um and there's a lot of suiting brands that will offer a, a bit more variety but only for jack blazers and pants and going suiting only right um and you're, then, you're focused on basics exactly we're start, we started with basics and we'll grow from there but really we want an everyday wardrobe not and thank goodness because not that many people are wearing suits now yeah um, <laughs> but yeah the bra industry oh there's a lot of bras that are doing half cup sizes and lots of different sizes for bras um but yeah, no one's really doing it for the clothes that we literally wear every day. It seems so. crazy that we're in 2020 and that you are the only company, at least that we know of here, yeah. that is doing this system. Because it seems so intuitive that especially in this world that moving more and more towards individuality and customization and having things built for you, that no one else thought to make a shirt that might fit a woman who's you know, a different size, yeah. you know, <laughs> same like height, eight. but like, yeah. You know, yeah. 
five foot. A lot of women are like five, seven. It's like, clearly we're not wearing the same size. Right. I mean, yeah, th yeah that's <laughs> it's just so, it's so obvious. I know my, like my sister is five, 10, but has the torso of someone who's like six foot four, like her torso right. is. And so, yeah. and so what ends up happening is like, you know, it's hard for her to find shirts that actually cover her whole stomach because she has a long torso. And yeah. so like, how like what is she supposed to do and it just seems like that would be such a common sense thing that that companies would try to solve am i right in guessing that the reason why more companies don't do that is because of a, a fear of having too much inventory because essentially instead of having a small medium and large if you have a small medium and large but then you also have three width sizes that you're essentially instead of having three sizes you would now have nine sizes right or, yeah. or nine skews definitely you're 100 percent correct about that i think one reason is no one's ever done it so never ever thought to do it like why reinvent the wheel i guess some people would say um okay. you know like if you're starting if, especially if you're a person that wasn't already in fashion or didn't have the pain point or you know for me i was the head of fittings and you know creating the sizing so I saw it all the time. Um, but if a lot of people start fashion companies and never been in fashion, right? So they're just like, we're going to follow the rules that have already been set. Why well, change it? Um, but, and then reason number two is definitely a cost efficiency. Um, right. You know, a lot of people do one size t-shirts, right? Because that's going to save you, it will save you a ton of money. Um, you can cut more, your labor cost is down, your cutting cost is down because those people can layer up you know, a thousand ply fabric and just laser cut a whole bunch of the same size. Like the more sizes you add, it's going to add to your manufacturing cost mm -hmm. and then your inventory. And for me, it definitely is a learning curve. Um, through the first year of selling, I really had to pay attention to the data to see for the next round of orders, which sizes do I need the most of? Which sizes can I go lighter on? Because there's definitely a few sizes that you just don't sell as much. It's not of equal course. across the board. So it's, um, you know, a lot of learning and data analyzing to get that right, which is an ongoing thing for us um, since we are new. But I don't foresee it as being a problem forever. I think that you will learn it and you'll get it right and you can, you know, really capitalize on the fact that a lot of short and tall women will come to us because they don't have other options. And then right. there's a lot of women that buy the regular size and I think they're really attracted to the sustainability aspect and the fabrics that we, you know, engineer to be as soft as possible. So, um, yeah, but it's definitely a financial concern. I think for a lot of people with the amount of inventory you have to house and how, how you can sell through that. Yeah. It seems like it, it's a bit counterintuitive that someone who's branching out on her own, who's bootstrapping everything would be the one to start a company built around housing more inventory and more SKUs. Was that difficult for you when you were first getting started? Yeah, um, definitely. But it was, you know, what, my passion was and what the company was built on so i was determined to do it but like i said that did wipe out like what i could put into the company and like left me with no marketing which has been very hard because it, this is almost when you're starting something that isn't out there yet it's almost a new educational standpoint like you have to educate your audience on what you're doing yes you don't have someone that already does it to be like oh i get it they're doing what they're doing you know like this company I already know of, they're, they're doing the same thing, maybe slightly different, but when it hasn't been done yet, you really have to have a, you know, expert marketing to teach the people first what you're doing before you can convince them to even buy it because they're a bit confused. They've never seen it before. And so that was a really big struggle for us. Yeah. It makes sense that someone yeah. like, uh, you know, it's a lot harder for Uber to get things started if no one's ever done ride sharing than it is for that second person for, for Lyft to come along and go, hey, yeah, we're like Uber, but better. Okay, great. That's really easy for me to wrap my brain around. Whereas, wait, I'm going to get into a car with a stranger. And so it, yeah. it, it, I'm sure it's a similar where if someone has never had to shop with the two number system, 
if for basics, you're just, you're, you're having to educate. And so that's exactly. just one, one more, not drain on resources, but it's one more place that you need to put that investment into. Exactly. There's like definitely a, a bit of skepticism and same with like you, the you know, analogy of Uber. A lot of people are like, why would I get into a stranger's car when I can just take a taxi? You know, like right. they're like, why should I do that? Like I'm a little skeptical of this idea and it's the same. It's like, why would I pay a, you know, a, a bit of a higher price for a garment that I, like comes in this length and it might fit better, but who knows? Like I have this other t-shirt that I deal with, you know, like I already right. have a brand that like is good enough. So right. do I really, do I really need to do that? Um, and so it is a bit hard once people do buy it and they understand, and, you know, it's great. Our return and exchange rates are so minimal. They're unbelievable for our industry, but getting the new people to understand. Mm. Do, you, and, do you have the numbers for those? Yeah. Our return rate is 1%. Um, and what's industry our, standard? Oh, like 20 and above. Wow. So you yeah, have like, essentially consumer sometimes will hit like a 50%. Return. Oh my gosh. So you have like between two and 5% of the industry standards return rate. That is like yeah. mind blowing. Yeah. And I think our exchange rate is 3%. Okay. So, so, you're, so you're doing something right. Right. Because once they receive it, it fits. You know, right. like, <laughs> what a novel concept. Yeah, exactly. But it's just like getting those new people and especially bootstrap startup. It's, it's definitely that's the hardest part. And because you are providing this solution to the non-standard size for that most brands are built for, have you found that you, that your, um, that the 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 sizes that you are selling are in different proportions to what the average company is selling like if the average company is selling a you know maybe a, a has your standard bell curve and it sells you know to mostly smalls and mediums or have you found that you are maybe hitting a niche for smaller and wider or taller and thinner or or, or is there something that's atypical to the to the customers who you are serving as opposed yeah. to the Our, average fashion brand though surprisingly because i'm short so i feel like every short person needs my brand um surprisingly our sizes sold out first we do have quite a few sizes that sell out and they're the small and medium longs so it's the taller people but small and medium is still our most popular sizing that we see fly out of the inventory um but we definitely have some customers that are loyal customers that come back over and over again that are extra large. And um, those are also extra large longs. So it seems the longs are apparently a little bit more popular than the shorts. The shorts would be what you expect that they're the extra smalls and smalls are buying the shorts. Whereas the longs, I see it across the board, like small long is a very popular size. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I, I guess to, to use my sister as that example, it's the person yeah. who struggled to find something to, to meet the torso length. So with that, I think we have a, a, a nice background set here to move into the mid-COVID set. But before we do that, as always, it's time for our guest's unsponsor. The unsponsor is a small business who cre they create an awesome product. It's an awesome company run by awesome people. So Andrea, tell us who today's show is not brought to us by. Yes, today's show is not brought to us by Private Packs. And why should our listeners support Private Packs? Yes, I, I do know the founder. She's a fighter. She's an amazing woman. She actually launched this company while beating breast cancer and couldn't be more proud. But she creates a product for women, but also could be for men. And it's especially designed pack that is both hot and she has a hot and a cold that fits for your private parts and i think it's a really important tool for a lot of women to have i personally have not had a child but anyone i know that has given birth is like that's like you need that or like even for a man or a woman like if you're riding a bicycle for like a long time and are quote unquote saddle sore it's another thing kind of like aelin where it's like oh yeah that makes sense why don't they why don't they already have that and so I think it's right. really what she's doing. One and of those things where you go to Google it and you're like, surely there will be a result. Exactly. Yeah. Or even for doctors, you know, I think she's really, um, I, and I hope it works out, but I think that 
hospitals could use those, you know, like there's lots of certain yeah. things that like, are, you know, like where it should be in the medical world, they should have that. Right. Something that's a little bit more uh, specifically tailored to the yeah. end use rather than just kind of a, a one size fits all, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, support her. She's really awesome. So private packs. Private packs. Yep. Got it. Okay. And with that, let's move into the mid COVID set. So traditionally on this show, we use March 1st as the kind of delineation between like BC and, and AD, if you will. But for us, it's BC and MC before COVID and mid COVID. For you, though, because you were or because you do produce overseas, I have this uh, this feeling, this gut feeling Mm-hmm. that you may have been in, uh, impacted a little bit earlier than most of our guests. Uh, when did you first start to see COVID have an impact on your business? Yeah, as early as November. Um, that's when, well, that's when I started getting nervous. <laughs> um, oh, with Hong Kong, my the offices are based in Hong Kong. A lot of the factories are actually in mainland China. They just have their offices like the people you talk to are in hong kong because hong kong wasn't as affected as badly as um you know the rest of mainland china but that's where the factories are okay and in shenzhen as well a lot of them are based in shenzhen and so they always close down for the chinese new year which you're prepared for um but this this in november this of last year um you started to see that they were confident that nothing was going to happen, but then, you know, we started hearing about COVID over there and the numbers were rapidly getting higher. And then they were, you know, we might have to shut down a little bit longer for Chinese New Year. Now, granted, they already shut down for almost a full month for Chinese New Year, which is also hard for industry, but we all know that and we're prepared for it. Right. That's that, and that's like three weeks in January. Is that right? Yeah, because their their Chinese New Year always varies um, between the end of January to early February when the actual holiday is. And they close about a week before the actual holiday through two weeks after. So they're always shut down at least a full three weeks. And they aren't back to full capacity until at least like four weeks. Um, they have a lot of employees switch over. So the employees go home for Chinese New Year and then they don't come back and then the factories get all new employees. Interesting. Very interesting, yeah. So, um, you know, then to tell companies here, like, oh, we might be shut down a bit longer. (laughs) It's like, okay, you're already shut down four weeks, now you're telling me it might be six weeks. Um, Was nerve wracking and, but again, you're like, okay, well, like we're in November so we can like plan this and you kind of try to, gauge when your new development can be made. For me, we did have, we were trying to do new designs. And so I knew that they're not going to launch when I thought they were going to launch. And again, we're a small company. So there are a lot of big companies they have to put ahead of me. And, you know, I respect that, of course, they also need to make money. And so they're going to focus on the really big numbers first, and then trickle down. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be a while. And then December, it was like the numbers got huge over there and they already started shutting them down early. So usually they'd shut down in January. Some factories had to be shut down like in, in December and they started what we're currently experiencing where you could only be open a couple days a week. You know, you couldn't have employees at full capacity. And so that just slows down everything and puts a company like Alin at the back of the list. Cause if you can only have half of your staff, and you're producing, you know, gap denim, that's, that will take you a full two months just to get that order out because you only have half of your staff. Right. So if you, right, if, if a factory has a $10 million contract or, a, or more, whatever, exactly. if they have an eight figure contract and then they have your four, five, six figure contract, obviously you're going to be at, yeah, at the back of the line and, and potentially in perpetuity at the back of the line. Exactly. So, so I knew it would be a wait and, um, and then it just got worse and worse. So, you know, before they, they shut down earlier than they usually would for Chinese New Year, all of them. And then they had to stay shut down all of February um, and didn't. So they were like just starting to reopen. 
on March 1st, which is your date for the BC and MC. Right. Funny because they were actually, that was the date that they started to reopen for us to be able to produce again. And then that's the date that we fell here. <laughs> so right. it was like, you know, it was just like one China fell and then immediately we fell. It was like, okay, great. So so you got, I, to, you got to experience it twice, essentially. Yeah. So I thought that by March, I would be able to launch new products that I could, you know, advertise and like I would be, you know, doing a grand launch of our new designs. I, you know, the goal is to launch pre-spring before Memorial Day. Once Memorial Day hits, you're, you know, everything's on sale and then people are kind of trained to look for sales from Memorial Day through July 4th. And then you'll have like a little bit of some full price things and you're going to go back into, you know, once you hit fall, like September, you'll have the new fall lines and then you hit sales again in November. So like when you, you don't want to ever launch in that sale period. So once you don't, I didn't want to launch a new product in May and have everything go on sale for Memorial Day. Um, so once I realized March, I wasn't launching new products in March, um, I had to figure out, okay, when are we going to do this? And then March 1st came and then America started experiencing COVID, which affected a whole different side because then that affected my sales. So you basically, you had three or four months of really serious supply side issues, Mm -hmm. which then made it that much more difficult to plan for what was going to happen, which was a huge unknown, which would, but I guess you had a little bit of an inkling just because you saw it coming from China, but then, then you had your demand side hit and I assume continue to be hit, uh, for, you know, basically since March. And the reason, by the way, that we use March 1st as our first date is because that was when the first COVID related death in the U S was, uh, it's, it's crazy to think that the rest of the world that was not the rest of the world, but so China was at least experiencing it for months and months, obviously Mm -hmm. COVID-19 because it was in 2019. And yet here we are still, you know, they, they were starting to reopen in March here. We are, you know, five, six months later and are still, we're still setting records. Yes. So b- before I start to go too far down that uh, that rabbit hole of despair, let's go ahead and just talk about how your demand has been affected by, co- by COVID here in the U.S. Yeah, I think the whole month of March through April, people were terrified, um, as they should have been. But, you know, places... Well, at least for New York City, which was where we're based, you know, it was in March, the quarantine happened. So people, you know, companies are closing down, or at least, you know, just shutting down offices, people are being furloughed. Um, Some businesses completely, you know, like some businesses never opened back up. Um, But you you got like a a bit scared with job security, right? You had no idea what's going to happen. If you're going to be laid off, if, how long your furlough is going to last, and so no one's shopping. You know, it's like worse than a recession. You have literally no idea what's going to happen because all of a sudden, for the first time in any of our lives, we're in a global pandemic. Um, so March and April, I think across the board in retail was desolate. Just no one was no one was going online to shop. Couldn't go anywhere to shop in person. So we had 0% sales in March. It was just like terror. Um, And, and, and I know you said you were going to focus a lot on, on doing the the pop-ups and the in-person events because those help drive sales. So those are obviously completely gone. Do you, do you have sales? Are are you in brick and mortar? No. Okay. So so it's, so it's pop-ups or online. Right. So we're direct to consumer right now, which makes it a bit hard. Not sure that being in brick and mortar would have helped because right. all of those businesses had to be closed and were, are also struggling. But yeah, it was definitely difficult. Like I said, we didn't have a huge marketing budget and we were planning on doing these ads this year and like start, you know, starting a big social advertising um, budget and plan. And so we didn't already have that. Uh, which made it difficult. We didn't have a lot of viewers coming directly to our site. That's why we used in-person pop-ups to create new customers who then came to the site. 
Um, so yeah, those were all scrapped, um, which was terrifying. And you couldn't plan for the future. And I still don't think you quite can because we still don't know what's happening. Uh, things are starting to open back up just now, but it's not, it's still not, I, don't, I personally don't think it's okay to like have a big pop up and like draw a crowd, right? Some states, in America would 100% do that. I think as a New Yorker, we're all still skeptical and frown, you know, frown upon that a bit. To Which I think is a, a totally that. rational perspective to have. I mean, yeah. I, I just saw that Florida apparently has now surpassed New York uh, at its uh, com comparative. Um, Florida is basically now like the, the number one state and is now worse than New York ever was in spite of New York being the epicenter when there were so many unknowns. Here we are again, five, six months later, we know so much more. And yet because Florida refused to shut down early and because we have this kind of uh, lack of a national policy on how to address things, you have these little fires all over the country and like you never, you never put them all out. And so they keep on, spreading to adjacent states so it doesn't even matter like really what one state's policy is mm -hmm. so yeah of course you're you're not you don't want to be doing these pop-up uh right yeah pop yet, and, and taking temperatures of of yeah. your customers as they're coming in when they just want to buy a shirt or two so it sounds exactly. like you've moved almost or well, i would assume entirely online is that right yeah, exactly. Definitely. I mean, I think we all have a little bit of responsibility to keep each other safe. So we have scrapped in-person events for the rest of this year. I mean, we have done, we just recently last weekend did a event, only the founders of the companies were physically at the event. It was in the Hamptons and we created, I partnered with a woman that I know and am friends with who hosts pop-ups all, all summer, every summer. And she usually rents out a boutique in the Hamptons. And I've been part of that many times with her. And so she called me in April and was like, clearly you're not gonna be doing a pop-up with me this summer. And I was like, literally not. And so she mentioned like, how could we um, do something virtually for our customer base that is gonna be a little bit different and a little bit new, but like, do you think we could put something on you and I together? Um, to create a pop-up through Instagram Live. And so we did do that last weekend. It was Hamptons Live, and she has a Hamptons house. So we hosted it in her backyard. We, you know, their Hamptons houses, they're beautiful. So it already right. was like a nice scene. We just like set up the signage. We gave, we brought in five other brands along with Aylin. Um, her and I were the hosts. Um, and we set up the tables more than six feet apart each brand was allowed two reps to come to the event and one of my dear friends is a popular DJ and entrepreneur she has um, person like these rosé rocker headphones and her name is DJ Nicole Rosé she was our MC through her she was not there but through her Instagram live so she brought on each brand and they're just announcing their new products for the summer cool. talking about summer trends we had a couple cocktail brands there, you know, like talking about summer cocktails. So we kind of tried to create what would be a normal pop-up, a joint, you know, a collaborative pop-up in the Hamptons online for viewership to come and experience it. You could order a VIP bag where you got the cocktail kit delivered to you with samples of each brand stuff. So you could kind of feel like you're there with us. Um, so, you know, like doing things like that where it, trying to think outside of the box and experience yeah. it with how can we make you feel like you're at an event with us, even though you're not. And I, it's just an always evolving thing. And how, how was the response? It was good. I think that, you know, sales are a bit confusing because you can't just, there's no button on Instagram live to be like, yep, want that quick, you know, and right. shoppers want the easiest, easiest path to buy as possible. Yeah. They, they don't want to have to go to a hundred different places and to be able to shop, you had to go to the brand site to buy whatever they were showing. Right. So like figuring out that component is definitely needs some work, but it, it did bring new viewers. Like we did get more followers. We got people inquiring. So um, that part's good. And that's what really matters because you can all, as long as you get new customer relationships, then it's on you to 
you know, turn them into a paying customer later on. And that, that's why I have been trying to focus on through this entire experience with COVID is how can we just gain more viewers? How can we get more followers? How can we build our email list? How, you know, how can we just attract potential customers that we can then figure out how to turn them into customers? Right. How do you, how do you add people to the funnel? Yeah, exactly. It's just like getting more eyes on the brand. So I think in that sense, it, it was a good event. And so that's what we're really focusing now on in mid COVID and just continually trying to find new ways to be creative with that. I think also people are starting to get sick of just virtual events. Like everyone has to zoom everyone, everything's, you know, like on Instagram live. So I think we will have to pivot again because people are kind of bored of sitting in their homes, staring at their computers. You said that, that obviously in-person sales were down yeah. essentially a hundred percent. I mean, like they're, <laughs> if you can't be in person, you're not going to have in-person sales. Yeah what percentage do you or do you know off the top of your head kind of ballpark ish what your revenue split was between in person events and online sales before covid yeah in person events was above 60% I, it oh was my gosh 60, 60 to 65 so we would you know i have you have a, a weekend pop up and you'd sell thousands of dollars of product each pop you know what i mean like you're right. You're coming home being like, great pop up. <laughs> yeah. You know, you have so, so, amount of sales. And then throughout the week, you know, you have like your average e com sales, which aren't nearly as high. So you kind of, I really counted on those. Um, right. So you're saying essentially two thirds of your business was basically wiped out with the, the banning of in person events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, how, how have you seen things? Because I feel like I asked this question. Because I know for, for my business, when I tell people, oh, well, we're really hurting because we can't do the Costco road shows and we can't do a lot of uh, kind of in-person events that do help drive awareness of our brand. Oh, well, I'm sure you're doing really, really well online. And it's like, yeah, we're doing better than we were before COVID. We've right. certainly seen an increase in online sales. But for us, our online sales were only like 5 to 10% of our overall sales. So unless they went up 10x, there's just no freaking way that mm -hmm. we're going to get back to where we were. So for you, you would need your online sales to triple to make right. up for the, the pre-COVID revenue. Right. Have you see, what, what have you seen as far as your online uh, e-com growth? Yes, unfortunately, they have not tripled. <laughs> um, like we said, right, it's a totally unrealistic. Yeah. yeah, like in March, you know, they were down a hundred percent, and then they've like slowly gotten back up. So we're just now getting to like what we were before. So like still thirty, thirty-five percent. So even your online sales went down significantly yeah online. yeah yeah they're just like because in march and april i just don't think anyone was shopping like no one wanted to spend money on clothes if they right. were shopping and also even though we do sell a product that's great to wear every day and great on a zoom meeting i think for women especially like the only thing they were really buying during quarantine was makeup for their zoom meetings or like facial products like self-care products people were like if i'm gonna sit at home i'm just at least gonna try to take care of myself and feel happy mm -hmm. but no one was really shopping fashion no one was shopping any types of apparel brands i mean i've been in the industry for a while so i know a lot of different apparel brands and i have friends in many different companies and everyone was down there was no there was no apparel brand that was thriving for you know through march through april even you know into may so it's like we were down a hundred percent so we had to build just to get back to where we were right um, and, and, so and now remind me to... remind me what your uh what your company size is in terms of staffing yeah that we're lucky on it was already very small okay um there's for full-time employees it's just myself and my cmo and then everyone else that works with us is a contractor is okay he's like, a contractor freelancer yeah um so i didn't have health insurance or benefits to pay to you know to many people um we have five employees overall that are consistent contractors they're they're now 
part-time, but like a couple of them were full-time, but still as a, a as contractors, time. right? Yeah. So that was, that was great. Um, in the sense I didn't have to quote unquote lay anyone off, maybe had to reduce hours and figure things out like that, but we, we were already small. So that, um, overhead of employees was, wasn't too bad for, for Aileen, but it also meant that I didn't get a PPP. I was just going to say that. Yeah. So the PPP, it was based in basically entirely off of, uh, your four quarters of payroll leading up to, uh, let's see, I, I, I want to say it was like basically through February is essentially like when we went to apply for our PPP, we brought in our DE nines. I think it was the form and it was basically just like your quarterly payroll reports to the bank. So for you, you're paying, your contractors are considered kind of expenses or like cost of goods, not considered mm -hmm. technically payroll. And so the PPP, you're, you're kind of the, the hole in the, the PPP's armor or whatever analogy you want to use. You get zero. You're to completely overlooked. So the PPP was announced and you're like, oh, cool. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they were like um, any contractor, they, would, they could apply for it themselves as like an independent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like I could apply for myself as an independent and it was like i was going to get bare, like nothing and right so, and when those contractors are applying for it yes they're still getting the money but because it's not linked through you it's not like they're yeah, going to come just, work for you for free right because they're getting because they're still getting money from the government right. yeah so that was a bit unfortunate i had to deal with it you haven't seen numbers they're, they're trending in the right direction right now yeah uh, but they're they still haven't recovered to where they were prior to covid right. so with that in mind you do have some small victories though and yeah. actually they're not even small victories they're they're huge victories in yeah. terms you said you were focusing on growing that news the the uh newsletter signups mm -hmm. do you mind sharing the the pre-covid numbers and then what you yeah. have now because i feel like it's like such a huge victory worth celebrating yeah, definitely. So yes, we do. And you know, we always have known that we wanted to focus on our online business. It, it is an online business, we're a direct to consumer business. So right. this kind of gave us in one sense an opportunity to take the time to focus on building that email list and building our following all on all social platforms. Um, because sometimes when you're doing an in-person event, it takes it's a lot of work when I when it's I'm doing it all. Mm -hmm. um, and I have my CMO and, you know, a few people helping, but it, it'll take a, a weeks of preparation and then like you're out of town and blah, blah, blah. So sometimes you don't have the time to focus on building your online side of the business and which we is essentially should be the core of our business. So we did take the time during COVID to do that. And pre COVID, we had an email list of so we, something just a bit over a thousand. It was small, like 1100. Mm -hmm. um, and so our CMO Tamara Lane did an amazing job of partnering with some larger brands to do fun giveaways and these cross promotional email campaigns and set up, you know, a lot of different ways of getting people to sign up for, you know, a chance to win something or through, you know, a brand they already follow that believes in us. So with, some different cross promotional strategies. She was able to build our email list to twenty five thousand from eleven hundred. That yeah. is incredible. I am I am uh, proud of. I, I, I'm I'm like ha happy to hear of a of a success like that. I'm also like a little bit jealous because that is just like such a dramatic uh, increase. I mean, that's like normally that would take years and years, and you and so. I feel like that is that certainly bodes well for upcoming revenue projections. Although, how to? Well, I see. This is. I'll just ask you. How are you projecting your inventory now that you have seen such a? You've seen on the one hand a huge dip in sales because of people are really conservative in, in their online spending right now because obviously there's just so much uncertainty in the world that with that uncertainty, people tend to play their cards really close to the vest. That being said, you have now, you know, it increased from 1100 to 25,000. 
you're assuming a lot of those are going to, or, or at least a decent portion of that list is going to start converting to sales. How do you prepare your inventory when you, when you have to place that purchase order three months ahead of time? And of course, cash flow is, is an issue. How, what, what are you doing to move forward in terms of inventory planning? Yeah, well, right now we're not doing too many reorders because sales have been down and we have to be hesitant and we don't know yet what that conversion rate is going to look like from these new subscribers. And for fashion, an average open rate on an email, for instance, is for people that have huge lists, you know, like gaps or whatever. Um, sure. Is only like like 5% or less. Like okay. you know, click, the click rate is very, I, I think the open rate might be like 15%, but the click rate is like 3%. Yeah. Um, and so we're lucky that our open rate is still like in the, between like 30 to 40%. So it's very high for that. Um, and our click rate is like a 10%, but we, these emails just hit our list um, in the beginning of July, mid July. So it's, it's new, right? So we're still learning to see how many people drop off and what our click rate if we can keep it up so we're holding on reorders but we're still we're now doing that development that we meant that we wanted to do last december that we wanted to come out in march we now want it to come out for the new fall line um you know when people fashion week for instance in new york city which um, is canceled but right of course is, uh september but all of the brands are still going to find ways to showcase their new lines, right? So what we did want to launch in February, March, we now want to launch in September and we really want to make a big splash with all those new people and, you know, that we have new products. So we're actually going to focus on doing a small capsule of new product to offer. And especially for all of our, we have a 45% return customer rate currently from previous years. Wow. Um, but Do you have any idea how that compares to the industry? Yeah, I think that it's it's high, but I it seems really high. Yeah, it's really like between twenty. I feel like average would be twenty to thirty, and I think that that is a very like a big varying number. But on average, I would say it's about twenty percent, and ours is like yeah, almost fifty. But our returning customers haven't bought as much this year either it might not just be because of covid though we don't have a new product so they bought everything <laughs> right we so also, we want to focus on like giving a few at least like a small capsule of new pieces and have you know also with online like online advertising online shopping people want to see new content and when you have the same 15 styles for a year and a half they're like okay i've seen a picture of that but you know like they went yeah new so, so we're we're really um we're gonna our inventory is okay like some sizes are sold out some sizes are really low we'll do reorders like small ones along the way if we have to but we really right now are focusing on the new ad campaigns that we're launching because we i did still have that marketing budget set aside and i, I didn't want to do it right when there was quarantine and no one was shopping and i wanted to hold on to that at, for cash flow reasons just in case everything went awry but like it's looking okay now so we went on we went and brought on a facebook and insta ad marketing specialist and she's working to get those ads launched next week and you know she will directly work with that new email list to make sure that they're all being retargeted so you're really you're really making sure your audiences are targeted in a perfect way to convert them into consumers um and so that's really what we're doing we're making sure that we work with her to convert as many of those subscribers as possible and launching some new products to get those new people excited but also to you know get our loyal customers right that, like we're we will we do have new stuff coming we swear yeah so essentially you let's see so you, so to kind of to to summarize here you saw the supply issues those first few months before ever, anything ever really came to the US so november december january february you were dealing with supply issues then you saw huge demand issues 
which are still not back to pre-COVID levels as there has been that level of uncertainty and therefore kind of cons- a change in consumer buying habits. You had money set aside for a marketing campaign originally in March and April because you wanted to release those new new styles ahead of Memorial Day. But then obviously you didn't want to release something during sale season. So then, you know, you fast forward and you've the way that you've made adjustments, I think is just incredible to have your newsletter list built up to what it is. It sounds like being able to uh to maybe have a tighter turnaround than some of the bigger brands does put you in a in a um in a good position to adjust quicker than the bigger brands but at the same time it's still a relatively long process and of course you're still dealing with kind of the uncertainty of your cash flow issues so with all of that said it sounds like uh it would certainly be uh, understandable if you had some sleepless nights how has your mental state been throughout this and and where are you now uh, with just all of the uncertainty? Yeah, definitely had, you know, some, a couple breakdowns, but not like too severe. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. It's difficult. You know, they say like being an entrepreneur is one of the loneliest jobs. And, I've heard that so consistently. Yeah. And from it's my very guests. True. Yeah, it's it's very true. And even if you like are working with a team, even when you are allowed to go to an office and work with a team a lot, you know, like you're making a lot of the decisions on your own. And um, if you're like the person running the place, you're it, it just is kind of a lonely job. Like there's not there's camaraderie, but like you know, if you're an employee, you're not like gossiping or hanging out with like the founder. So um, and then when you take away the office space and you stick them at home in a home office alone. <laughs> then you're right. just like, okay, well, okay, I really have to try to keep it together. Um, I, in the beginning was, I, it was just like stress all the time. Like just couldn't sleep. Definitely a lot of sleepless nights. And then I picked up, I, I just started exercising every morning, which really helped. And I always like, remember like thinking like, entrepreneurs that would say that I'm like they're crazy whatever like who I'm too stressed to work out and then I was like okay well let's try this and so so that helped me get through it um just really trying to get on a schedule and make my home office like really feel like an office uh I mean living in a one-bedroom apartment in New York City also is difficult like people with not in New York City that have homes that have an actual home office like I'm like oh you're that's special because you know, your part of your, a portion of your living room being a home office is difficult, but yeah, I really had to focus on mentally like for my mental health, just being on a schedule, um, forcing myself to go to bed at a certain time, um, and waking up early, getting a workout in and, um, you know, kind of clearing my head during that time. And yeah, that, I think that seemed to help. I, my significant other also went on world travels right before COVID. So he's been in Bali, um, living his best life. Oh my gosh. (laughs) What a place to be quarantined. Yeah. So he's been in Bali for the last five months. So then also like I didn't, I had, you know, like no one, which was kind of sucky, but, um, just adding in insult to injury in the in the game of yeah, loneliness. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't even have like you know like so I was just like at home with no one. I had like the first two months I did all these home improvements on our apartment. We don't own our apartment, but I was just like whatever. Like I repainted everything. I built like shelves for you know like I had a circular saw inside a New York City apartment. It was like sawing these giant boards and like staining them. Amazing. And, like, beautiful big shelves. Like the shelves literally weigh like a hundred pounds. They're giant. Um, and just like redid my whole apartment while I was having no sales. Right. I was like, okay, I guess I'll just redo my apartment. So, you know, I think that was slightly a breakdown. People were like, I don't know how you had the ambition to like take on big projects like that. And I was like, because I couldn't physically think about like all of the bad stuff going on. So I I did kind of ignore it for a couple of weeks and like was just sawing things and drilling things. I guess kind yeah. of got my anger out. And then um and then yeah, got myself on a schedule where I was like, okay, 
let's pretend you're going to an office. Get up, work out, make your coffee, sit at your bar, act like it's a desk. And um, that helped, but it, it's, it's hard. I think, you know, I have a community of female founders that I'm friends with and you really, you need that. You need other people that understand it, that are at the same level as you. you might also have a startup and a lot of stuff going on where they can sympathize and you know, have the same kinds of things happening in their life where you can just chit chat and like get it out because talking to someone that's not doing what you're doing and as you would know, like it, it's just, it's hard because they don't understand, you know, they don't get the same stresses that you're going through. And a lot of people will be like, but it's fun. Like you're doing fashion, at least you're being creative. And like, you know, what you do is cool. And you're like, mm -mm. <laughs> like, no, it's, it's a business. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's like, <laughs> you know, we make uh, coconut energy bars and people, and I feel like sometimes people are like, oh, so you're just like baking and eating and like eating a bunch of chocolate all the time. Like, no, that is, it's, it's, you're producing like, essentially you are producing widgets and it doesn't matter what those widgets are. You're running a business and you're trying, you're just trying to sell items. And at some point, like, yes, there's a passion for, for, for the brand, for the company, for the product, but most of what you are doing is like that behind the scenes, you know, whether it's like the accounting or the marketing or whatever. Yeah. It's not like the, the fun, you know, it, it might, if it looks fun from the outside, that means you're creating a fun brand, right. but that was built on countless hours of like blood, sweat and tears and sleepless <laughs> nights and effort and mostly emphasis on the sweat and the tears, hopefully not too much blood, but uh, right. you know, it's, it's stressful and it's lonely. And, uh, I, I appreciate your, you know, being, being candid because I know that your experience is, it might seem lonely and therefore unique, but I promise you that there are tons of other small business owners who are going through very, very similar feelings of like helplessness and hopelessness. So I'm glad that you are finding that you were like making all of these, these positive life changes and adjustments to make it through both personally and professionally. Right. Cause yeah. I mean, that's like, it, this is obviously that the COVID, the COVID monster is not going away anytime soon. It seems like best, the best case scenario we're halfway through. I right. don't know. I think that's, and that's what I always think about. I'm like, is this how, you know, like this is our life. This isn't just like a, a small like event that we're going through or you know just like a little wave it's like this is our lifestyle for the next who knows how long but we have to be used to it like we have to you know like yeah accept it and do whatever it is to the best of our ability to get through it because i just don't think you can think of it as a short-term solution like you have to think of this as how you're living possibly for another year you know like, yeah so get yeah. used to it and enjoy it and find a way to enjoy it. So, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't easy in the beginning, but. But we're, we're, you know, we're making our way through it. Yeah. So uh, as we wrap things up here and you you look to the future, um, it sounds like you're certainly uh, making the adjustments necessary. You're you're putting a lot of focus and time into building that that newsletter uh, subscript subscriber base. W what else are you doing that maybe you wouldn't have been doing uh, without COVID? And are there things that you are almost, this sounds weird, but as we try to end the show on a positive note, are there things that you think will make that are making your company stronger so that coming out of COVID, you will be potentially in at least some aspects in a better position than you would have been otherwise. Yeah, well, I think that definitely goes along with creating a, a larger viewer base with social media and our email list for sure. Like we're trying to lay the groundwork to have people to talk to about the product. Um, and then we're constantly, like I said before, we did the Hamptons live event, but we're constantly brainstorming what's the next type of event we can do to, you know, draw uh, more people to see the brand and also as, you know, a PR stunt, you can say, but like to get more press and more coverage. Um, so, you know, 
like I said, September is usually fashion week and we're like already thinking about like what kind of like fashion show or like some, you know, what kind of thing can we do virtually that'll be really exciting. Um, we also, I was able to bring on board the previous design director of Zach Zach Posen, which is very exciting. Um, I think because of COVID, she didn't have another full-time job and we were, we were friends from when we worked together. And so she's now coming on to be our creative director at Alin, which probably would not have happened if it wasn't for COVID. Um, uh, so that's really exciting. And I think that we now have, you know, part-time, all still contractors, but we have those employees put in place in a, a larger, um, I guess they're not, it's not a customer base yet, but you know, a viewership that can, you know, that are seeing our emails, seeing our posts. And now we have an amazing designer that comes from extremely high end brands before Zach, she was at Carolina Herrera. So she's been at very like couture level brands. Um, you know, we have a marketing ad specialist that's on board. We still have Tamara who was able to increase that email list. And then we have um, two new, um, one marketing assistant and another design assistant that have been doing a great job. So kind of, still a small skeleton team but you know we now have all the components to make it right so hopefully over i think through august we should really see a big difference that's when our ad campaigns will go live we'll be talking to all of these new viewers and we'll see how it goes um we'll we're looking to like maybe add in a lot of video stuff um whether that's just ads or hosting our own little shows on Instagram lives to talk about trends and fit issues and help people better their wardrobe right. through our own expertise. So I think really focusing on the internal team and just bringing, you know, bringing on more people to the top of the funnel is going to set us up for post COVID if that ever happens. <laughs> If right. An AC after COVID. Gosh, I sure hope so. Well, it sounds like you're doing everything right, and hopefully there will be fewer sleepless nights uh, yeah. in the future, as you know that you have at least laid the groundwork for some some serious growth. And when there is that post COVID moment, and you are allowed to have those in person pop ups again, you're going to have this amazing foundation of increased viewership and subscriber base and just general mm -hmm. brand awareness, such that I'm sure those pop up events will be more successful than they have ever been. And I'm super excited to have you back on the show at some point and and kind of hear the the updates on just how successful it was and what orders of magnitude of growth you you've had. So uh, with that, Andrea, thank you so much for being on the show. Can't wait to have you back. Thank you to Andrea Seemayer, founder and general boss of a -Lin. Check out her wares at alindesigns.com. My unsponsor of the day is Drops. My wife and I just placed our first order of their pre-measured laundry pods. They'll arrive with free, carbon-neutral shipping, zero waste, chemical-free, and with safer ingredients that are all disclosed, lightly scented with natural essential oils. Find out more at drops.com, and that's drops with two P's. Check out smallbizgoneviral.com for all episodes and updates, see our past guests and suggest future ones, and more importantly, send me ideas for future unsponsors, aka small businesses who deserve a shout out. Thank you, Peggy Bunker and the Bunkmates for the music, Christina at Pasty Design for the weekly help creating episode graphics and updating the website, Worldometer, NPR, Robinhood Snack, and Morning Brew Daily News emails, and a little search engine called Google. Someday this will all be over. Until then, stay safe, stay socially distant, be kind, and wear a freaking mask. From a windowless office in North Pacific Beach, San Diego, recorded and edited before and after work hours, this is is Small Biz Gone Viral. And as always, we're back with our quick lightning bonus round with three questions. Question number one, what are some common misconceptions about your business? That it's glamorous 24 seven because it's quote unquote fashion. It's not <laughs> all glamorous. Number two, what is your least favorite part about being an entrepreneur? 
when all the decisions end up coming to me. And sometimes it's a lonely life to try to figure it out by yourself. And because we like to end the show on an up note, what is your favorite part about being an entrepreneur? Yeah, building a team and empowering people to be the best that they can be. I really love to see the people under me grow and thrive and being able to do that for them and encourage them is 100% my favorite. That's it. We did it. Yay.